Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we started in 2020 with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're looking forward to resuming hopefully here in September of 2021, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, with our guest today. But our goal is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome a big time subject matter expert onto SALT, whose uh, subject matter expertise is extremely relevant, especially uh, in the age of COVID. Our guest today is Professor Sadal Neely, uh, Sadal is the Naylor Fitzhugh Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. Her work focuses on how leaders can scale their organizations by developing and implementing global and digital strategies. Again, nothing uh, more relevant, at no time more relevant than in the age of COVID starting uh, early in 2020. She regularly advises top leaders who are embarking on virtual work and large scale change that involves global expansion, digital transformation, and becoming more agile. Her most recent book is called Remote Work Revolution, Succeeding from Anywhere, and it provides remote workers and leaders the best practices necessary to perform at the highest levels in their organizations. Prior to her academic career, uh, Sadal spent 10 years working for companies like Lucent Technologies, the Forum Corporation in various roles, including strategies for global customer experience, 360 degree performance, software management systems, Salesforce sales management development, and business flow analysis for telecommunication infrastructure. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also a graduate of Harvard Law School. So they, I know that uh, Sadal and Anthony have crossed some paths or have some mutual relationships that they might get into today. I'm glad you mentioned it, Darcy, because I would have mentioned seven <laughs> times that I went to the Harvard Law School, at least seven times in 45 minutes. But Professor, what a great accomplishment. What a great life story. Congratulations to you. And having gone to Cambridge Latin High, uh, and there you are uh, across the river, what an amazing uh, experience. Um, I guess I want to start, you know, there, if you don't mind. Uh, tell us how you grew up. Tell us what you were thinking about. Did you think you were going to be a business school professor at the Harvard Business School? Tell me tell me where you were, what you were thinking about. Wow, Anthony, you're going to go right to it, huh? Um, so, no, I am a reluctant academic. Uh, this is the big reveal. Uh, I actually never thought that I would be a professor, much less a business school professor. I grew up as the daughter of small business people, entrepreneurs. Uh, and when I was about 19 years old, my father said to me, you know, Sadal, you're interested in business. Uh, you need to learn how businesses make money so you need to go into sales. I said, what? You need to go into sales and learn how organizations generate revenue. What kind of sales? Anything. So and like any you know, self-respecting 19-year-old, uh, I started with candy, Anthony. I sold candy. Uh, uh, eventually, I started to uh, sell technology systems, consulting services, uh, and eventually met all of these mild-mannered uh, academics in one of my big uh, consulting sales jobs who didn't have sales quotas and who are all mild mannered. I said, you know what? I wanna be like one of those people. And so here I am, Anthony, I'm a mild mannered uh, uh, academic at the Harvard Business School. And um, along the way, did a lot of traveling with my work. All I've right, always so believed that the world so, is small. So, so John Darcy, we've established that she's a great sales person. <laughs> The minute they tell you that you're mild mannered, you got to hold on to your wallet. Okay, so let me just make sure I know where my wallet is. Okay? <laughs> We're I virtual. Know, Don't worry. We're virtual. At, I know you're coming at the game with a jujitsu that I can't properly manage. Well, before we go into my more urbane and academic questions, though, tell me your favorite candy. You started in candy. So I'm a I'm a Reese's peanut butter guy. So what what what's your favorite candy? 
I'm a toffee with chocolate type of gal. So score, Heath bar. Yeah, yeah, you realize bad. I'm answering yeah. questions I've never answered in life. Uh, no, I got to know. Okay. So Darcy, I've got this toffee place in, in, uh, because I love toffee, by the way, because I'm, oh, you know, I'm a so little, I'm a, I'm a total foodie. I got a toffee place it, it called Enstrom's in Colorado. We got to, we got to send some to Professor Neely. Okay. Can you take right that, please? Absolutely. Okay. I'm oh, gonna, in my heart I'm gonna forever. I'm going to try to win your heart and mind. It's happened. Your You're the salesperson. Yes. I'm going to try it. to win your heart and mind through your palate, but let's. It's happened. To, let's go to the remote work revolution succeeding from ev- anywhere which is your book. Uh, and let's start with why you wrote the book and how timely the book is, by the way, because it's coincident with the pandemic. And tell us uh, what you were thinking about when you wrote the book. And now let's apply it to the real world. We're all living through the COVID-19 pandemic. What about the book is relevant and accurate? And what about the book did you miss? If you missed anything, tell us, tell us your observation. So this book had been underway for a very long time before the pandemic hit. In fact, it was uh, a pet project for me because the problem I was trying to solve was people telling me after years and years and years working with executives, teaching with executives, managers and uh, virtual and global team members that no matter how much they themselves change their behaviors, to be fabulous uh, virtual collaborators, unless everyone else develops the same skills, it's not helpful. How do I get my group, my team, my unit on the same page? So Anthony, I started hiring artists to look at visual language. I started to hire curriculum design people to try to produce a book that would have stickiness to it when groups and teams uh, used it. Um, and I was I had about 250, 260 pages worth of written material, research illustration, and I was walking around with it with no publication date in mind. And in the meantime, while actually working on a different book called The Digital Mindset, COVID hits. This book was uh, then produced in two and a half months because all that work had been uh, underway for about three years. Uh, It pains me. It really pains me that we've landed in this place uh, because of this deadly virus. But the virtualization of work is something that I've always felt would be a core part of modern organizations. That's why the book is organized to bring to bear all of the success factors when people go remote. And the actual structure of the book uh, is relevant to COVID because uh, along with the Harvard Business Review, we did a Q&A session with managers uh, and ended up with the uh, themes of the book uh, because all these people kept asking about productivity. How do I monitor people? How do I ensure productivity is maintained? What digital tools do we need? How do you maintain connection and trust uh, in global work? And in fact, after this Q&A session, we posted it on hbr.org and it garnered almost half a million uh, downloads in just a few days. So we knew we were capturing the key questions and the book is structured in that way. So you ask what? Uh, did I miss uh, in the book? I actually don't think uh, uh, I missed the essence of what people need in order to construct uh, very effective organizations that includes virtual arrangements. But I wish I had some more things around remote teaching, remote learning, uh, things like that, more specific uh, things uh, that people care about. Uh, And to correct that, uh, in a way, um, I've launched a course called Remote Work Revolution for Everyone. It's free. It's on the Harvard X platform. And we've, we've made sure that there were affinity groups like teachers who can work together and learn together. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean it in a pejorative way. I meant oh, no. in a, you know, academic setting and then the academic world is meeting the real world. And since you are a great intellect, you, you, I knew that you would 
synthesize and try to figure out what's there. And so more teaching, more online teaching, more, more of that. I guess the thing that plagues me, uh, which is near and dear to my heart, is someone that's trying to run a company remotely now for the last 13 months. You can never find John Darcy when you need him, <laughs> Professor Neely, just so you know, okay? He does show up at these salt talks appropriately t- attired, but I have no idea where he is unless he's here on a salt talk. But we'll talk about that. You and I will talk about that separately. But my issue- Because I'm in the office. Where are you, Anthony? Still in your basement. I'm, I'm in my basement like Joe Biden, okay? It's been a very successful strategy <laughs> for Joe Biden. And it's going to be my strategy, and I'm sticking to it. So what I want to say, Professor Neely, is what I'm worried about is what John is actually addressing. We're out of the office uh, we have issued a return to work uh, memo for May 3rd, I believe it is, or May 4th, um, which is coincident with where the municipal workers in New York City are returning wow. to work. Um, of course, we are being lenient related to, you know, people that are concerned or have safety issues, comorbidities, things like that. Um, I've requested that people get vaccinated. I'll just talk to you very candidly. And again, that's a request. I'm not mandating it or anything like that, but I believe in the science behind the vaccination. I myself have been doubly vaccinated. Oh, nice. What I'm worried about, though, is the culture, the lack of physical proximity. Um, I feel like I'm shooting in the dark as somebody that runs the organization in terms of creating the culture. Am I wrong about that? What do, what do I need to do? Be my career coach. Uh, you've got so many people that listen into this thing that are worried about the same thing. What, what, do, you, what do you tell them? It's, I, I think you're spot on uh, when you talk about culture as being the fundamental issue that leaders like you and organizations are concerned about. And it's for that reason we find that 68 to 70 percent of organizations would want people to come back in person. But the tension in that and the challenge in that is that the majority of employees don't want to come back to the tune of 81 to 87 percent. 81 percent is the number that Harvard Business School Online recently um, uh, gathered from a survey. Uh, 87 percent comes from the Gartner Group, uh, a survey they released in December. Of those numbers, 27 to 30 percent want remote work full time. And Uh, leaders uh, who want people in the office, I think you have to be very careful when you force people back, uh, first of all, because you know that they don't want that. The second thing is physical proximity does not equate strong, cohesive cultures. In fact, what is culture? If the definition of culture is what are our shared values, And for most of us, they've stayed the same in our organizations. What are the things that are important to us? The second half of that, or even 75% of that, is what are our shared norms? Uh, How do we do things? How do we communicate? How do we solve problems? How do we make decisions? What are our attitudes and behaviors, essentially? COVID has completely killed the cultural norms that we used to have because we've been working remotely for the last year. So the idea that we're going to go back to some old culture is actually not accurate, not true. And for you, Anthony, career coaching, you have to learn how to lead and build a distributed organization. If you were a global organization and had a presence in other parts of the world, they're not in that same space with you. So physical proximity and borderless leadership becomes incredibly important. I think that's well said. I think it's an interesting perspective. If you're running a, a Fortune 500 company, you're, uh, many of your people in your mind are working remotely. They're not in your corporate office. And I, I respect that. But let me ask you about the, the dilemma. I'll, I'll call it a transition dilemma. Uh, we asked people to leave. Uh, they left. They're operating to the best of their capability. In fact, our firm is doing a reasonably good job remotely. Um, I now sort of want them back. Um, but you're saying something that I agree with. You are coaxing them back. You're not mandating it necessarily. But I sort of am, you know, in the, you know, passive aggressive sense of that. You or know. aggressive aggressive. If or you aggressive. say come back, it's come back. You're the boss. Yeah. yeah. 
So what do you, what, what's your reaction to that, Professor? I, I, I think Anthony, um, and I, I, you know, this is how I talk to any leader, CEO, uh, nation state uh, advisor. Um, you have to adapt and be flexible and join the revolution that's taking place. Do you want people to be uh, having water cooler conversations that are full of resentment? Do you want to lose loyalty and commitment? With remote work, lifestyles have improved dramatically. And, and by the way, I absolutely don't believe that remote work is a panacea. Uh, and in fact, in the book, you'll see that I write about all of the challenges that do exist, like being out of sight, out of sync, out of touch, uh, and out of mind. All of those things are very true. But these are all competencies that we need to build in order to reap the benefits of uh, the virtual environment. People are more satisfied. People really value their autonomy, which is really self-control, flex time, spending more time with the people that they cohabitate with. It could be family, it could be other loved ones. And uh, productivity has gone up in most places. So our historical arguments around productivity have been debunked as well, right? So the, 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 the only thing that we need to work extremely hard in developing is how do we connect and how do we convey culture and establish new ones, despite uh, the fact that we're not in the same place. And I'll add one more thing, if I may, please, um, Anthony. It's the fact that even physical spaces are going to be different. Uh, we're going to have one-way hallways. We're going to have social distancing. Uh, you're going to have signs all over the place. Health will be uh, something that people- Temperature checks, temperature about. checks, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Temperature checks. Uh, and even if you want to hold meetings in your old conference rooms because of social distancing, other people will have to dial in using their laptops. So you're going to have what I call a distribution meeting anyway. You're not going to have everyone at the same time. So the idea that we're going to return to our old cultural norms, we need to abandon and learn how to create and maintain culture, even when we don't see everyone. That's interesting. You're, 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 you're coming at it from a faith perspective. And I don't mean a religious perspective. I mean, you have to have faith in your people. You have to have faith in yourself and you have to inculcate that in, into everybody. Is that a fair assessment of what yes. you're saying? Yes. And faith in your people uh, that have proven that they can do this for over a year. Uh, and in the remote environment, I always find myself quoting Ernest Hemingway. Uh, never quoted him this much in my life. But what does he say? How do you know you can trust people or that people are trustworthy? By giving them trust. You yes. start with a default of trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. You equip, you empower. It's a, yeah. yeah. I, it's interesting because it's also how do you how do you become powerful? It's by giving power away. Okay. You yes. know, and that's the irony of it. You know, unfortunately, I had one or more conversations like that. See, Darcy's laughing in that other Hollywood square box because I've had more than one conversation. <laughs> with various people in my short stay in the White House about calm down, share the power, but we didn't go in that direction. But that's a whole other topic. So, and, 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 and while I'm looking at Darcy, how do you deal with guys like Darcy that are at the water cooler talking resentfully? How do you deal with those types of people? Well, let's hear I'm from kidding, him. I, I I'm kidding him. about him, obviously, because I love him. I'm talking about, you know, yeah, the, how do you deal with the resentful employee? It, it, you know, if you are the cause of that resentment, it's not going to bode well. So you deal with that resentful employee by meeting people halfway. You, you, you talked about power. And I'd love to hear from uh, John as well, because he represents an age group that's been struggling a, a good deal that we should all care about in just a moment. But this, this thing is when you have up to 81 or 87% of your workforce wanting to retain some form of remote virtual work, who holds the power really? Who holds the power? Yeah, we well, want listen, people's I, I'm, hearts I'm and sure. minds, right? Yes, I, I'm a big believer in delegation and creating autonomy. So I'm I'm for the openness. 
but I also believe that we've got to mix it up a little bit together once in a while. And so I'm hoping to get to that compromise. We're going to let John uh, talk in a second. He's got some tremendous this good. is like an HR meeting. This is yeah. He's got tremendously good millennial-like <laughs> questions. He'll outstage me here in a moment. But I want to ask about workplace equality initiatives, and I want to ask about issues related to race and progress while we're operating remotely. Is it possible? Impossible? What do you say to people when they say, "Geez, I'm searching for more diversity. I want to create more inclusion." But I, I don't. I don't have my office uh, all together. Is that an issue? Yes. Or not an issue? Yes. Tell me what you think, there, Professor. Yes. So the topic of equity is incredibly important, especially as we are mapping out the future of our work and our workforce. And there are a couple of ways of thinking about it. One is uh, we want to make sure that uh, we. Um, uh, are thoughtful about the people that we're asking to come back in our hybrid environment, that we're not looking for low status or even people who are super junior starting out in their workforce and pulling people back uh, who uh, are of certain demographic groups. Uh, We need to watch our bias. The other thing is uh, many organizations have talked about the fact that they have much more diversity in different parts of their organization with people that they deem to be essential on-site people. And uh, if you are devising, and you talked about mixing it up, a a hybrid workforce, your on-site essential people need to be able to participate in being able to learn from home and do certain things from home. So we need to be very creative in ensuring that everyone gains from the virtues of remote work. In terms of inclusion, uh, one of the things that we need to make sure is that people have the technology that they need to work, uh, that they are in areas where broadband is accessible. Uh, That's one uh, equipment structural point, but we also need to make sure that we're democratizing conversations, that we're pulling people in. If we're in a video conference call, a Zoom call, uh, we need to make sure that certain groups are not receding because when you're in the actual communication event, uh, you end up uh, losing a lot of voice. So people have to work extra hard to draw people in as well. So I've talked about structural. I've also talked about the very micro and communication event. Last thing I'll say is that People are beginning to tap diverse talent from outside of their headquartered areas uh, in order to bring them into their organizations without asking them to move. This is a competitive advantage. This is an opportunity to seek diversity for more places than we ever have once we begin begin to detach our talent pool uh, from uh, uh, physical locations. It's it's a really good point, you know that you know you you create more competition um, for staff, but you're also broadening the staff pool by having all of this remote activity. So hopefully, it'll lead to higher quality people. So let me turn it over to John Darcy, who is sitting in my office while I'm here, ensconced safely in my basement, drinking my Starbucks. And John, you know, you may want to turn my kids' pictures a little bit so that they can get a get in the view there. It's- well, I, I think it's it's emblematic of the times that we're in. So I've obviously been working from home for most of the last year, coming into the office sporadically. But when I'm in the office, I struggle to work in a COVID work environment. I don't have my webcam set up on my desktop in the pit that we have here on our office. I have to come in here into Anthony's office and onto his machine to have the capability to operate in the way that people normally do. I almost feel handcuffed when I'm at the office because of the environment that that most people are working in still, which is a remote work environment. So I'm trying to retrofit my workspace slowly in my office to meet sort of the capabilities that I'm able to achieve from home. And I think Anthony has experienced that as well coming into the office, which he's done periodically, uh, is that he's got a state-of-the-art studio in his basement, which you have as well, uh, Professor. You talked about how all the Harvard faculty has multiple cameras and virtual backgrounds and everything set up Uh, for a remote teaching environment. And it's almost, it's jarring in a way to come back to the old way of doing things because we feel uh, like, you know, we we sort of went into the future in terms of our capabilities uh, that we're able to achieve from home. 
That's incredible. That's really incredible. This is very, very true in that we've set up super advanced home offices and our work environments are not set up this way. And what about the commute in? Can you say a word yeah, about no, that? I would say it's jarring in some ways. You know, again, I, I've been coming in a couple days a week uh, over the course of the last several months on and off. Um, but yeah, it's jarring. You know, I think before you got used to two and a half hours of commuting probably every day is what I have in my life. I live on Long Island. I commute into Midtown Manhattan. And I think my commute relative to some of my colleagues is actually less. Um, so you, you talk about two and a half, three hours a day commuting. When you're used to waking up and being able to start your day as soon as you get out of bed and, and end it, you know, at the end of the day without having to, to commute home, you know, it is jarring to, to sit there on the train and the subway and everything to go through that process to get into an office where you do feel somewhat handcuffed in a lot of ways. And so I think going forward, you know, a lot of people talk about the hybrid work life, uh, you know, balance where you're able to come into the office when you need to and, and work remotely in your state of the art home office when you need to. If I were designing the future of my workplace, that's what I would probably choose where it's also mentally healthy to be able to spend more time with your family when you need to and things like that. But, um, you know, I do think yes. that I, I sort of fall somewhere in between that old school thinking of we got to get everyone back in so we can really look over them and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the new school of, you know, just go out there and, and trust that everyone blindly is doing the things that they're supposed to be doing at home. You know, John, uh, I'll add to your, thank you for sharing, by the way, uh, this is incredibly valuable because it provides insight into the lived experience of coming back and what that's like. Uh, Microsoft recently did a major survey in looking at people's experiences and behaviors through you know, all the data they collect. Uh, and they surveyed some 30,000 people. Uh, and part of what they are learning as well is people are saying that they're saving money uh, from the commutes that every day you buy coffee, you have lunch. So there's been a lot of savings for a lot of people as well in the last, uh, in the, in the last year. But the, the, the part that I wanted to highlight too is people want like Anthony mentioned, to be in person for the bonding, for the culture, for the connection. Uh, it's not just uh, to monitor people's work behaviors. It's just you want to see, you want to connect. But if you go in the office and no one's there or two, three people are there, it's not going to be like it used to be. So connection has to be uh, really created in a more intentional way. Well, what a dilemma practices. for all of us. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the great parts of your book is you, you go into critical and, and concrete steps that people can take, um, you know, best practices, both for organizations and for individuals in terms of maximizing productivity and maintaining culture in a remote work environment. So what are some of those best practices? Let's start from an organizational perspective. If somebody's looking to really optimize this remote, remote work environment and they want to maybe go to a remote work environment long-term. And may I point out that two of the most valuable private companies on the planet, one being Stripe is now a hundred billion dollar company. They have emphasized a remote workforce and they have one of the most global engineering workforces of any company in the world. And Coinbase, which is set to wow. start trading live uh, on the NASDAQ exchange, probably at about a hundred to $150 billion valuation, doesn't have a headquarters. They have basically committed Incredible. themselves to saying, we're a fully distributed workforce. So what are some of those best practices that you think some of those companies that have done it well yes. have done? Yes, um, so first, Anthony, you're right. Uh, he has better questions, I'm just kidding. Um, so here's here's uh, the thing. The, the, the first thing is- I'm, I'm, I'm stopping my video just so everybody knows, okay? <laughs> because I've now don't. been, I, all of my confirmed fears and insecurities have been proven true by Professor Neely. Let me just turn the video off as we're doing this right there. It's that's really that's really funny. No, no he does I, have better questions. That's, and by the way, he's he, a star. He's a star. So I oh, like I could tell. That's why I like teasing him. I mean, come on. It's, it's a gener, it's a generational struggle over here. Neely, let's go. I know. Help I out your it. fellow baby boomer. OK, I see. I see. I see that John is a star and yeah. I'm trying to help you to retain him. OK, uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. All right. And, let and me pay so, attention. So I'm working on it. All right. So, let me put the he, volume up higher then. Hold on. <laughs> So um, uh, I think you won my heart when you referenced my book, John. Let's just, uh, so listen, 
here's the deal. The very first thing to, to do is to make sure you survey your organization uh, and your workforce anonymously to understand true and real preferences. Because once you do that, then you can look at what jobs, what tasks, what functions can actually uh, be remote and how remote can those be. And in some organizations, we need to really look at what is the optimal level of fluidity that the organization can bear. So you mentioned a couple of companies, Dropbox and others are now declaring themselves as remote first companies. Zillow, notice they're all tech companies. Um, and Twitter and others are saying that people can autonomously choose to go remote, or if not, they can come in. This is one of the important conditions of an effective remote workforce is that people have choice. This is why I worry about forcing people in. The other thing, uh, John, is that we need to make sure that people have the right competencies. Uh, managers and leaders need to know how to lead virtually. It's different. It's not the same uh, set of things. There's some very natural but detrimental aspect of virtuality that people have to manage very intentionally. Similarly, everyone needs to better understand how to use all of the digital tools to be effective uh, at work. What do I mean by digital tools? Anywhere from email to uh, enterprise-wide software uh, systems to video conferencing. How do we use them? When do we use them? Because there's a phenomenon called tech exhaustion. Tech exhaustion, which is about cognitive overload, because people have just been using technology nilly willy. There's actually very systematic ways uh, of doing those. Those are all the things that uh, are important. And then finally, some of the large companies are bringing in chief remote officers into their C-suite uh, in order to manage uh, the large workforces or their highly distributed workforces. This is where the question of culture comes in as well. I'll pause here. Let's go to the individual. You know, I think we've all experienced Zoom fatigue. You know, a lot of companies are going to Zoom free Fridays, you know, to get people off of staring into the screen, you know, uh, as they've done for most of the week. Um, so, but I think Zoom also has the benefit of, I used to do so many conference calls, right? Where I would be on the line, there was a faceless person I was talking to on the other end. And during the work from home period, I've actually gotten to know some of these people better through Zoom yeah. because I'm seeing their face and I'm having before we even start a conversation about, you know, whether it be a sponsorship for our conferences or, you know, whether it's capital raising that we're doing, I'm sitting there looking into the face of people around the world that I didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily able to do that at scale before. So what are some of the best practices for people to, to leverage the technology that's at their disposal, but also to avoid the, you know, the, the technological burnout that people experience when you have high volume of Zooming going on? Yes. Let me first begin by saying that Zoom fatigue should not exist once you learn some of the best practices related to digital, digital tools. Like we should not have Zoom fatigue. It should go away. And we call it Zoom fatigue. You know, Eric Yon has endorsed the book, so I won't call it Zoom fatigue. I'm going to call it tech exhaustion because <laughs> you can have the same problem with, with other uh, uh, tools. But here's the thing. You use the right technology for the right task, for the right goals. Not everything requires live or what we call synchronous communication. Some things are actually much better for, to be used in an asynchronous communication mode. For example, if we need to process very complex information, the last thing you want to do is call a Zoom meeting or a Microsoft Teams meeting and have people listen to some terribly complex uh, uh, information. It's better to email that information and have people asynchronously absorb that information and internalize it. So two dimensions that I will mention uh, when it comes to digital tools. One is synchronicity. Should it be synchronous or asynchronous? The other dimension is, should it be lean 
media or rich media. Lean media includes things like Google Docs or email. They don't convey, just like you mentioned, John, um, a variety of expressions. They don't convey uh, emotionality. They don't convey context. But not every communication requires that. Rich communication does. So you can imagine a two by two, which is actually in the book, where certain activities work really well depending on whether you want it to be synchronous, asynchronous, lean or, uh, uh, or, or rich. Not everything requires rich and synchronous, which, what, which is uh, what uh, video conferencing is. Right. The other thing is meetings are too long. For some reason, meetings have gotten longer in the last year. They need to get shorter. Yeah, you know, it, it's difficult because we try to maintain at SkyBridge the, t- the type of engagement that we have at regular meetings and in-person interactions that manifests itself in the form of frequent, you know, large scale uh, conference calls. But at the same time, it potentially detracts from productivity and, and things like that. So it's, it's an interesting balance uh, that we're trying to strike. And I'm sure that many others are trying to strike as well. But I want to talk about loneliness. So I, I have the, the great fortune of having a beautiful wife, three beautiful kids. And so during the, the pandemic, I have enjoyed spending time with them and not felt some of that you know, level of loneliness that I think a lot of people have felt. Uh, that are a little bit more isolated. With that being said, you know, I haven't been able to nurture a lot of my friendships the same way, uh, you know, with with my extended family or my friends the way I normally would. And again, going back to those people that are even more isolated, you know, you can Zoom as much as you want or you can go on Microsoft Teams as much as you want, but it, it maybe doesn't replicate uh, the level of social interaction that's healthy uh, for human beings to have. Is that true? How can we nec- How can we potentially use technology to replicate uh, some of that social interaction in a way that uh, eliminates some of those feelings of loneliness? And how in general do we maintain our mental health in a way, you know, humans are hardwired, I think, in a lot of ways for some level of social interaction. So how do you find that balance in a digital world that's that's mentally healthy from a social perspective? Huge problem. Uh, And in fact, Uh, I call it professional isolation. Uh, Millennials have struggled in the last 13 months with isolation. uh, And especially if they're not necessarily uh, um, with others in a household or they're back into their intergenerational homes, just feeling isolated uh, and uh, kind of excluded from the activities that uh, uh, make them feel connected to others. It's a massive problem. And in fact, uh, US Surgeon General Vivek Murthy and I had a conversation about this. It was a NASDAQ podcast where we talked both of us because he thinks a lot about this topic, it's a mental health issue. Um, So you cannot think about replicating what you do in an in-person into a a virtual environment. You have to think about these things differently. And you have to think about them uh, through multiple means. So Vivek actually talked about uh, how even a 10, 15 minute phone call uh, can nourish us in extraordinary ways rather than zero. I believe that organizations today have a responsibility, particularly if people are engaged in professional work outside of their organization, to make sure that people feel connected to others uh, in the organization, meaning you actually want to pair people up to work together on projects, create teams when in the past it could have been achieved through individuals. You, You need to check in on people more The Gardner Group conducted a survey several months ago and found that 40% of managers never checked in on people, not even to say, how are you, how are you doing? So you have to make sure you're building in micro moments uh, in, uh, for example, a regular meeting uh, of 60 minutes, 10% of it is spent on checking in, connecting at the top of the hour, six, seven minutes. You pair people up and you have them working together. You do all of these virtual uh, activities and including learning, training, doing learning that are interactive together, another powerful way of breaking the isolation. So we have to do things outside of being taskmasters to make sure that people are connecting with one another. That's part of our job now. 
So I want to talk about the future. So right now we're going through this sort of the beginning phase of what I think is a transition back into somewhat of a hybrid environment where you start to see some organizations like Skybridge, like Goldman Sachs and others pushing their, their workers to come back to the office as soon as May. You have a lot of companies talking about the fall. They're going to encourage people to start coming back. But I want to talk about, let's say, 2030, you know, almost a decade down the line. How can you reimagine the world in a way using things like remote work and digital tools that you write about in the book? What does our world look like and how can we reimagine our society more broadly in a way that leverages remote work to, to make the planet thrive, to make human beings thrive? You know, what does the future of work really look like in 2030 if we were to you know, get in a time machine? John, this is a dissertation topic. Uh, <laughs> I think you might have to take it up. Um, it's a very good and important question. I strongly believe that the last 13 months has not only accelerated the virtualization of work, but it's accelerated everyone's technological advancements. Every organization had to leap forward when it comes to technology. What I think is right behind us, which is why I think we need to get this hybrid virtual right, it's not going to go away. We need to learn how to do it. We need to take a leap of faith. We need to experiment. We need to lead not in terms of fear and anxiety, but opportunity and uh, scale. And uh, the digital revolution is right behind us. And what do I mean by that? Data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, personalization, matching, building online communities, and building networks of people. That's what I perceive based on everything that we know and all the acceleration that we see, that, um, uh, that work is going to shift in extraordinary ways. We're going to have AI bots and agents who we're collaborating with. We're worried about building connections with other people. We're gonna have AI agents working with us. And institutions are going to use bots to, practice, to have people practice negotiation skills. 2030 is going to look very different. And I think 2020, 2021 is preparing us for it. And those who do will leap forward. And those who don't will um, move slowly at their peril. I would love to hear you uh, do an entire podcast on that subject matter, because I think it's fascinating. Like you talked about AI, there's a lot of different views on what it's going to do to society. I think there's some people that think it's going to displace a massive number of jobs in a way that we're going to have to find new ways of connecting with each other, of adding value uh, to society and, and just rethink our place in the world. And I think that's a fascinating point that, uh, that the pandemic sort of gave us a preview of that world. I want to ask you one more sort of big picture macro question. I'll, I'd also like to get Anthony back in here just for some final remarks on everything we've talked about, but what is one innovation or product? You know, I don't necessarily want you to feel like you're having to shill for, for one software solution or something, but what's one innovation you think has the potential to most markedly transform the workplace? Ooh, one innovation, one product. Yeah, is it teleconferencing? Is it something like Slack that's a you know asynchronous collaborative tool? Or, or what are things that you've seen uh, people experiment with that you think have the potential to create sort of new paradigms in terms of how we work? Because I, I think email is an example of something that's so archaic and uh, it creates so much stress and anxiety, you know, that ping that comes in through your email that I think there's much more effective ways to collaborate I'm just curious if you've really observed anything that you think is is highly innovative that's so, going to disrupt existing systems. So, so my answer is going to be different. It's not about the technology. By the way, I get about 10 emails a day. We've got a new innovation. Would you talk right. to us? Would you look yeah, at it? Would you, would you, yeah. it's, it's hard to sort through them. And there, I cannot tell you how many people are working on different things right now. And I don't think that's where the innovation is going to be. The innovation is going to be in our behaviors and how we use them. The number of technologies and their proliferation is not going to go down. It's actually going to go up. But we need to develop digital first mindsets and think about scale and think about uh, augmenting everything that we do through the technology that's currently 
absolutely present. So I don't even see people using present technologies effectively and to scale, to connect, to do work uh, in smart, intelligent ways. I would begin there because what you don't want to add, John, is more technology uh, in uh, our world. There's so many of them. How we use them and how we strategize around them is what we really need to innovate around. This is my, well my true belief. Well said. Anthony, you want to chime in with any follow-up questions before we let Sadal go? Well, listen, I could listen to you all day, Professor. I mean, the, oh, I appreciate the, the, thought, the thoughts are uh, right in the wheelhouse of where everybody needs to be. Uh, I want to thank you for joining. Um, I think the future of work is going to be very different over the next five or 10 years, but you're going to have a lot to say about it. And so uh, I'm thank looking, you forward so much. To, looking forward to following up with you. And since we praise John Darcy, I'm very grateful that we're in the month of April and not December because he'd be counting the coins. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the bonus, right? So the good news is I can get his head, you know, back into the right space, hopefully over the next six months. So listen, I'm teasing Anthony, John. I'm teasing you. Okay? He's he smiling. Fan, Professor Neely, he gets fan mail. Okay. Does he really? Yes, he gets fan oh, mail. It's unbelievable. I love yes. That. Could well, someone please send me some fan mail, please? I mean, I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm <laughs> it, it was a real, it was a real uh, breaking point in our relationship, Professor. When, yes. when I started getting fan mail, you know. Yes. Listen, you, you're a superstar, and that's really obvious. I'm so thrilled to have spent this time with you, Anthony. Uh, please let go a little bit, trust a little bit, join, join the revolution. All right, uh, I'm with and, you. I think, uh, I think, and I think, I think you'll think be you happy. Some, with it. I think you said some very meaningful things. And uh, I'll say to all my old fashioned friends out there that got raised in the 70s, uh, we have to embrace the future. And I think that you've made a very big statement today about how to do that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to pushing this out to as many people as possible. And I want to thank you for coming thank on. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Take Professor. Good care. And thank you, everybody who tuned into today's Salt Talk. We think these topics, uh, as Professor uh, Neely alluded to, this is sort of the beginning of a new world. I think there's pre-COVID, the pre-COVID world, and there's a post-COVID world. And the people that think that we're going back to the old ways, I think are mistaken. And I think the people that are preparing for the future are the ones that are going to excel. A lot of the companies that we mentioned that are already embracing remote work and all the tools that you need to make that work productive and mentally healthy uh, for your workforce. So please spread the word uh, about this SALT talk and all of our SALT talks, which we think are are very important to educate people about different things that are going on. But just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous talks, you can access them all on our website at salt.org backslash talks. Instead of doing virtual conferences, which we also, also think are an ineffective delivery method for, for thought leadership, we've created this webinar series uh, just to allow on-demand resources for people to consume them on their own time and at their own pace and, and whenever they feel compelled uh, to watch a video or listen to a podcast. So. Uh, we look forward to a lot of people consuming this one. We're also on social media. Uh, on Twitter is where we're most active, at Salt Conference. We're also on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as well. And on behalf of Anthony and the entire Salt team, I want to thank you again, Professor Neela, for joining us. And signing off for today, we hope to see you back here again soon on Salt Talks.